thank you very much to Christine, to um, all of the people who helped organize this conference, and especially Claire and Natasha, who have done the hard work of getting us all here and making sure we have hotel rooms and all those important things. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, as, as the opening talk, I need to say that I'm talking about genomics by implication, but not by specifics. And I think uh, for, for those of you who don't see the connection or want to hold forth more on the connection, there'll be ample time to do that in one-to-one -one conversations or if there's time for questions and answers. Uh, so, oh, forward, you have it down here, okay. So the title, just to move backwards again, title of the talk is The Ontogeny of Se Sexuality or, or in other words, how do we get from here, photo of a variety of little newborns, to here, um, to young kids who I think any of you would look at and say you knew which one was the boy and which one was the girl. So how do we get from that newborn, you know, really undifferentiated state to a state that becomes pretty differentiated even by age three? Or even here, um, Jazz is a seven-year-old natal male, and if we can cue the uh, film. me why I used to be a boy and now I'm a girl. I would say that I have a girl brain and boy body and I think like a girl but I but I just have a boy body and it's different than you. So um, so that's the question. The big question is how does gender differentiate? How does gender identity differentiate? Um, and we've seen in, in these images the conventional differentiation and then the less conventional differentiation, which uh, at least in the States is a lot in the news these days. It's sort of under, it's come under notice in a, in a new kind of way. Um, so a couple of things to remember in trying to think about this. Uh, the first is that you always want to keep in mind uh, the difference between sexual dimorphism and sex difference, and I'll spell that out in a second. Um, and the second is that you always want to keep in mind that individual human development is a process, not a static thing. And that process is, it's, it's a way of thinking about the world uh, that still needs to become more common than it is. So first, what is a sex difference? What do I mean by when I say that? I'm talking about traits that can be statistically differentiated between boys and girls or men and women, um, but that also overlap. So in this, in this example, we have uh, a little boy with his dad in a big red truck, and we all know that little boys love trucks, and, that, and you can get by age three statistics that show how many more little boys love trucks and how many little, how many little girls, but you still have little girls that love trucks. Um, so that's a difference. There may be a statistical numerical difference, but they, this is not an absolute difference. And you can see it on the other side as well, the little girls that love dolls. There are probably more little girls than little boys that love dolls, but there are little boys that love dolls. Um, so that's sex difference. What is sex dimorphism? Sex dimorphism is this. Um, so this is, this is an old cartoon from those of you who, who are as old as I from the feminist movement in the US. Uh, it took me a while to find it on the web again. But uh, as it's, it speaks for itself. But they're looking at their sex dimorphisms um, and then making a comment on what that explains to them about the world. So old ways of thinking about this uh, is that at where do sex dimorphisms and sex differences come from, but especially sex differences is what we're usually talking about. Uh, the old ways of thinking about this is to think about nature and nurture as if they come from separate buckets, and I've stolen this cartoon from Evelyn Fox Keller's book, um, uh, The Mirage of a Space Between Nature and Nurture. Um, and in the old ways of thinking about this, uh, nature and nurture are added, um, are added together. Uh, and so in this cartoon, 
uh, where we're have, talking about a 100 liter bucket. Uh, Billy is adding 40 liters and Susie is adding 60 liters and together you get the, the final bucket full which is the phenotype. So it's an additive model of, um, of phenotype production. Uh, and so, so nature and nurture are, so most people say, well, nature starts the ball rolling and nurture layers some stuff on top. Uh, another, what I consider old way of thinking about this is uh, that geneticists use more often today is the, the concept of gene environment interactions. And in this case, what you have is Susie is holding the hose and Billy is turning on the water faucet. And if you ask the question, um, which part of the final 100 liters is contributed by Susie and which by Billy, well, the question um, stops making sense because uh, they're each doing different aspects that, of things that produce a final phenotype. I've pressed friends or colleagues who, who insist that this is the best metaphor, the um, interactive metaphor, and they, um, and they, what they come up is, is it, and is frequently used, is that of baking a cake. You put ingredients, the nature and the nurture together, you bake, and then something new emerges beyond the flour, sugar, etc. Um, so that's, but I, I still don't think this is quite right. Um, and so what's missing from this model? Uh, and for me, what's missing is iterative development. So uh, you bake a cake once and it's done. You might ice it, it's, then it's really done. But what happens during development is that, uh, is that you have a constant process of things going on and it's iterative because whatever has happened then forms the platform for the next thing that happens. So you're constant, it's much more of a bootstrap kind of metaphor, but also it's not a, a thing that you bake and it's done, it's a constant process. So um, what I'm going to talk about today in one way or another is how we might use concepts from dynamic systems to think about <coughs> sex and gender. One con frequent concept or, or image that's used by uh, people in dynamic systems, and it comes from uh, originally really from a developmental um, biologist, C.H. Waddington, who many of you will have heard of, is the notion of a landscape, a developmental landscape, in which um, you have something starting up here at the top, and it's kind of corrugated. They can start in, in different places, um, and then they um, they can roll, uh, that ball, depending on exactly where it is, uh, will roll in different directions. So you, the, this ball rolls down here into a deep well, which is called an attractor. Um, and the attractor refers to the fact uh, a fairly deep well is going to be a fairly stable attractor once the ball ends up in that space. It can be moved out of it, but not so easily. Um, if you have a ball um, in a slightly different spot in the starting space here, it might roll down into a different attractor. Uh, this one, this attractor being more shallow, it might be a less stable attractor. It might be a trait that is more easily varied by things that happen during development. Uh, the other concept is if by any odd chance this ball has rolled down onto the top of a hill, uh, I think this is the one I animated, um, uh, to where it won't stay balanced for very long, that area, that, um, that concept is called a repeller because it's a very unstable place and a phenotype may, be, may rest there sh for a short period of time but it won't likely stay there. So that's the, the basic concepts and then if we apply them to, um, if we begin to work in gender to the idea, uh, then we can suggest that at birth, so first of all, we. I emphasize that there's a timeline along this rolling landscape uh, with increasing age. And at birth, this ball here may represent a physiological variant of some sort. So they're all, you know, everybody's physiologically slightly different at birth. And, um, and so depending on where along this, uh, this ridge you might be, um, you might have, uh, you might end up being more inclined to roll down this valley and maybe forking here to this place, here to this place, um, and uh, or over here, these uh, here to this place or this place. And each one of these attractor valleys in the end 
I've labeled as gender variant one, gender variant two, et cetera, where I'm not being highly specific about what I mean about gender variant, but we can, um, we can read into that. Uh, we can talk about what might be meant by gender variants, but I'm, I'm really talking about people who express masculinity and femininity to different degrees um, and, and, and in different ways. So again, just to remind you, this would be an attractor space and a repeller would be up in this hill. And just again to show you at any one time, at whatever time this, this, if this were time, you know, if this were time one and this were time three, a variant that ended up here or a variant that ended out here could, with enough disruption, be pushed up over this hill and down into here. So it's not impossible that someone who is starts out at a certain point in life as gender variant two um, changes at some future point into gender variant three. Um, so that's kind of the theoretical background. I'll start specifying this for you. Uh, what are some known sex differences at birth? I, I got a hold of, uh, of a data set from a colleague who's done this huge, huge longitudinal study of head size, body weight, um, APGAR score for, uh, APGAR score is a test of, of physiological alertness at birth. Um, for uh, the, the data set that I calculated these from is, has 50,000 babies in it, it's, it's huge. Um, and the fact that it's huge allows us to find some very tiny sex differences. Um, not dimorphisms, but differences. Um, so, and if we look at head circumference, for example, we find that, the, that, um, that with, when you have a sample size that large, uh, you have a tiny bit larger um, head <coughs> circumference in males than in females at birth. These are term birth, full term births, with a very small effect size. Um, many psychologists would consider this to be actually not worth even mentioning. Um, same for weight. If you do on this large, you, have, you find that boys are slightly heavier on average than girls at birth, and again, a very tiny effect size. APGAR score at 20 minutes is actually better for girls than for boys. So, and again, tiny effect size, but girls are slightly more alert and more neurologically responsive at birth than boys. So what happens, normally what happens is people report these effect size piecemeal uh, and rather than looking at an entire system of what might it look like if we, uh, if we mapped all of these things together. So um, I've been working on mapping these data in a three-dimensional grid uh, in which I have the APGAR score mapped here, head circumference here, birth weight here in grams for 2,000 males that we culled out of this, out of this giant data set. Um, and you get a distribution that looks like this. Well, the higher APGAR scores are up here, uh, higher birth weights here, and uh, the larger head circumferences here. Um, and uh, did the same for females. And you can see that the, that the mesh that comes out at the system where you're looking at three important measures of development, weight, head size, and, and um, neural, um, neural development or sensory responsiveness have a somewhat different shape, which uh, in the whole, the population pattern has a somewhat different shape in boys than girls. And if you m merge these meshes, then you can see, um, see this more clearly where the, the greenish uh, graph are for the girls and the um, and the blue-purple graph are for the boys. Uh, and you can see how the population shape does look a little different uh, for, um, for boys and girls. So if you, um, and I'm just gonna circle some areas where there's not very much overlap. Uh, so down here, um, this is uh, medium birth weight, but uh, pretty small head circumference and very low APGAR score. So these down here are, are, not, are really not very healthy babies. Um, but you see as you go up in this upper area, you get, you get an area where the babies, the boys are getting healthier, but they're also larger and have um, larger head sizes. And, uh, and, and then in the final, in the final uh, area here, you have, you have an area where, uh, where boys have really strong APGAR scores, 
large head sizes and larger body weights than, than the girls. And the girls tend to, ha they also have this area down here, which is the same as the boys of, of kids who are pretty, probably pretty unhealthy um, to begin with. But they, have, they st tend to have a less variable, uh, a, a more medianly central, uh, central distribution if you look at the three of these traits together. Um, and one of the points is that I want to that I, I want to make is that it's important to ask to look at to look at at least three dimensions, um, but probably more if we could. It's harder to do, uh, to do the imaging beyond three dimensions. This wasn't <laughs> easy to get done either, um, as it turns out. But I have very smart undergraduates, uh, so uh, so um, so you begin to you want to try and picture really what whole populations look like with regard to all of these traits. And you may then want to know, does, does it matter? But I, I think one of the points is, is if you're only looking at head circumference, there is a tendency to say, oh, bigger heads mean bigger brains, mean you know, smarter kids. Um, and what you can see when you begin to look at this <coughs> mapping head circumference with APGAR score uh, that it, is that it's not necessarily true. There is a population for which it's true, but there are other populations for which bigger brains don't necessarily mean healthier kids. So what are some of the things that these combined developmental systems might influence in the next stages of development? And here I'm going to move into a discussion, really primarily, of things that are going on during the first year of development. Uh, which is often neglected. P usually in an awful lot of developmental psychology, uh, the earliest back people study is three years or maybe two and a half years, but there is a literature that looks at the first year of development. And there are some basic things. Uh, how healthy, how big a kid is, how well is uh, his various uh, systems, including the digestive system, um, which I don't have up here, are developed, will have something to do with infant ir irritability at birth. Um, infant irritability is certainly related to parental sleep. Um, and I mean, these are very basic and obvious, but they really do affect bonding and, um, and touch and sensory development in those first few months. Um, infant alertness uh, may be affected by how well developed the sensory systems are. And uh, parent infant bonding is part of the essential things that go on, especially in those first three to six months of development. So one of the things that I, I really remains unstudied are really good approaches to looking at how a suite of traits at birth might then translate into different kinds of parenting styles, different kinds of, uh, of parent-infant inf interactions, which I will show you shortly profoundly affect uh, the development of the nervous system. So early interactions and experience influence brain development. That's the next important point I'm leading to. Um, and this is a set of images of, of, uh, the, of a section of the fusiform gyrus, uh, which is important in speech and some other develop, neural development, uh, sensory development processes uh, at different stages of development. This first one is a drawing of a section from the cerebral cortex of a neonate. And you can see that, the, uh, that there's a certain number of neurons there and that they are slightly branched, nothing very impressive, but they, they um, just are beginning to grow out. Uh, so this is at birth. The second is at three months, and you see there's been enormous branching starting, uh, but there's still in these nerves, there's not so much new cells, but there are new connections being made between the cells. Uh, the next one is at... Uh, six months, and the next one is at 15 months. And so what you see is this enormous expansion of neural con connectivity in the first year of life. Uh, and so the minute we're talking about postnatal, and actually even there's interesting information that this begins prenatally, you're not talking about a brain developing by genes alone. You're talking about a brain developing in... Um, bathed in experience, in the in sensory experiences of all kinds. And we know enough about neuroplasticity to know that, um, that this kind of development is responding to the constant experiential sensory input that the infant is receiving. Uh, so, um, so that you have 
you have essentially, you have interactions and experience taking part in helping the brain to grow and in sculpting the way that it does grow. This other image is similar. Instead of showing um, uh, dendritic out outgrowth, it's showing the development of connections. And, uh, and here we have age. This is birth, year one, year five, 10 years. And these <coughs> graphs represent different parts of the brain. Um, I'll, the purple is, uh, is the auditory cortex, which develops enormously in this first few months of life. And the mustard color is the visual cortex also developing enormously in the first few years of life. So, so the number of, of um, connections within the first few months of life actually uh, increases, uh, the number of synapses uh, increases at least sixfold almost immediately. <coughs> uh, and again, it's happening in response to visual input, light input, auditory input. And that auditory input especially begins before birth. Uh, there's really good evidence that, that at least the last trime trimester, the brain, the auditory tracts are already developing in response to things that it, that it can hear through the uterine wall. So back to how we might think about this in terms of attractors. Uh, attractors change shape and become linked. And I'm going to give you an example um, this is my interpretation of Esther Thelen's interpretation of experiments by uh, Carol Rovi Collier, who's done really fascinating work on uh, memory in three-month-olds. Uh, and what she ha does is she, um, she hooks a, uh, um, a mobile over the crib to the infant's leg. She tethers it. Um, and the infant learns that if it moves its leg, it makes the mobile shake, and it likes that, and that's really really a cool thing. Um, and if she does that in different, with different contexts, she has what she calls the background context, which is a familiar context, uh, say the, just the test room wall or the crib design. Then uh, once the infant is learned and, and retested two weeks later, the minute they see the mobile, they start moving their legs even before they get the feedback from the mobile. Um, but it's the visualization in that context, it's the visualization of the mobile. The mobile becomes the attractor, um, and it's the mobile attractor that dominates. On the other hand, if she introduces something new into the context, what she calls a salient context, in this case, a, um, a toy or a teddy bear, a stuffed animal, um, then the salient context and the mobile um, both uh, both act as attractors. So if she does that, if it's something new, and then she retests later, she can show either the teddy bear or the mobile, and the kid starts kicking. So to start with, then, um, the mobile context, um, the mobile and the context form associated attractors. Uh, and then, if you, um, if you, at first, these associated attractors, the mobile and the teddy bear, are separately retrievable. Um, and with time, the memory of either reactivates the memory of both. Now, all right, so that's teddy bears and mobiles. What does this have to do with gender? Uh, I'll, I'll just postulate what, how it might help us think about the development of gender. First of all, if we think about the mobile, rather than it being a mobile, what about thinking about affection, warmth, and excitement, um, which are things that um, caregivers uh, provide to, to infants in various degrees. And I'll show you an example of, of, of these in a second um, from an actual video of an actual parent. Uh, and, uh, or we might think of the salient context as gender. So it might be that, um, that there's uh, warmth and excitement given at the same time that a toy truck is presented. Um, and that it's in, in that process uh, that eventually the notion of excitement and um, a gendered object become linked in some way uh, in, the, in the infant's uh, environment and understanding. So uh, first, uh, I'll, I'll put this into uh, an example of sex differences in toy preference. We know that by, um, by not by 12 months, but by 18 months to two years, there are differences, toy preferences, so girls uh, tend to gravitate more towards dolls. Again, this is a sex difference, not a sex dimorphism. Um, and boys more towards cars and trucks, at least in 
the United States, and I think this is true for Britain as well. Um, so uh, if we look at it this way, we have, and um, if, if we think of preference in terms of a truck versus doll, we think of exposure to, um, to that as happening. Um, and then we think of gender in terms of boy versus girl and what's happening uh, with time is that there's an increasing knowledge, gender knowledge and skills. And I'll show you what, these, what that means for someone under the age of one in a second. Um, but, uh, and then, and you begin, so you have here uh, time one, zero to 10 months. There's no sex difference in toy preference. Uh, so we've started before a difference has emerged. At time four, which is, is three years, there's a strong difference, sex difference in toy preference. So something's happened in between time one and time four, and um, and I'm going to argue that uh, that there are several things going on. One is exposure, um, and by exposure I mean physical pre presence, which I'll show you in the next slide, uh, and associated affection and excitement, which is also in the next slide. Uh, and at the same time, we have gender knowledge uh, uh, and also reinforcement of infant-oriented or originated interests. So there's, I don't want to leave the infant's spontaneous interest out of this because I think it's also a piece of the story um, and get, gets back to there being every infant being somewhat different and what attracts them and interests them. Uh, and then we have the gender knowledge skills, which uh, I'll show you in the slide after next. Now, what I have here are, um, are some little videos from a study that I've been doing of, uh, of mother-infant mother interactions, in, um, and we've been doing second-by-second -second analyses of the kinds of things that go on, the kinds of interactions that go on, motor stimulation, affection, these kinds of things. Um, and here, I just want to show you first physical presence. Um, hello. There we go. Uh, at, what I mean by physical presence, this is at, f with an infant that's three and a half, three and three quarters months old, and I think we can surmise it's a boy. So she's offering an object. You know, I'm on your phone. No, Facebook. Come here, look at mommy. Hold your Yeah. Maybe a football player like your daddy was? Yeah. 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 Okay, and I, that's his only comment that less. So, and I want to point out for, for since most of us in the room are not uh, Americans, that that Celtics bib he's wearing is a, is a, it's a basketball, it's the big Boston basketball team. Um, so, uh, so we have that. And then we have here uh, uh, an example of associated of excitement. She's she's making offers, and um, he's pretty little to be grasping yet. Uh, but but it's not in a particularly excited voice. But let's look at. Oop, ah, didn't want that. Come back. Now, come on. There we go. There we go. Let's look at this one, which is an older child, and look also at how much affection and excitement. Oh, yeah. Get get get. Getting the dogs out of the way. High pitched, excited voice. So that's not an unusual scene between a parent and a child. Lots of, but very, but notice the high-pitched voice, lots of excitement, and lots of affection while offering playing with a stuffed animal. So these are the kinds of things that are going on between parents and children throughout the first year of development. And I'm arguing that they are not only sort of teaching, they're not so much teaching cognitive levels lessons about gender as they are teaching um, the body. Uh, and the sensory system about um, about gender and different gender objects that become associated with gender. So, 
If we move on to the other piece of this, which is a developing gender attractor, that is, what are the skills that an infant develops? Um, infants turn out to develop uh, an understanding of gender in the world gradually, but maybe earlier than you might think, so that by six months, um, infants can discriminate male from female voices, and they can habituate to male or female faces, so they can learn to recognize male faces um, and then and then get used to seeing a male face, and then if a female face is put into the mix of things they're being shown, they'll stare longer at it. That's, that's a, a, a classical psychology way of, of finding out what a six-month-old knows about the world. Um, they can, at a little older age, nine to 10 months, they can correlate male and female voices with gender-related objects, um, and they can discriminate male from female faces and to start with, at this age, they can associate female faces and voices. And at a somewhat older age, a year, uh, a year to 14 months, they can also then associate male faces and voices. And I imagine that that's something um, that will change the more there you have males parenting at, in the very early years. I'm, I would bet quite a bit of money that, that that's not an innate difference. Um, but that that is an ability that an, that that's a, an ability that develops from familiarity, um, and what's more in their day to day life. So at the same time that children infants are interacting with their with their caregivers uh, around objects and around playthings, they are also um, developing the ability to recognize gender. And I would argue that then gender itself becomes an attractor, which at some point will becomes linked to the objects that are in their play world. Uh, so let's move on. Um, so this is actually recapping. Infants assimilate the world. Uh, they have sensory input, sight, sound, smell, touch, which drives brain development. As the brain develops, infant, the infant develops the ability to regulate both their own physiology physiology and their emotions. They can begin to regulate how often they cry. They can re regulate their own body temperature, which they can't, not so good at at first. Um, and uh, the infant begins to map the exterior world and body awareness onto themselves. The infant differentiates eventually their own body from that of the main caregiver through sensory feedback, uh, which again contributes to the development of the sensory nervous system. So embodied gender, then, um, begins, uh, I would argue, as a pre-symbolic coding, that is, before speech, before symbol, symbolism is available. Um, uh, infants are already working into their, somewhere into their nervous system, a sense of gender, um, of understanding gender in the world and of beginning to understand who, themselves as having a gender. Uh, so, uh, the way psychologists use the concept of pre-symbolic codes is that they are generated from sensory receptors. They take in information from both the outside world and the body itself and are initially encoded within the deeper structures of the brain. Gender gradually, with, as age, with development, becomes symbolically embodied for infants and by three years of age, um, they do have a symbolic understanding of gender, but a symbol in to toddlers is an act, verbal or behavioral, that shows that the child can substitute one thing for another. For example, talking into a block of wood as if it were a telephone. That's a symbolic act um, for, uh, for a two-and-a-half-year-old. So, um, newborns, I want to show... Um, I, I want to show you some examples that are from the literature of newborns coming first to their pre-symbolic senses. And this is just giving you data on what newborns can do because it's kind of extraordinary and very neglected in any understanding of how gender develops. So, for example, newborns can learn in utero during their last trimester, for example, based on maternal voice. And the developing neural system involved would be the auditory ner nervous system. Newborns can discriminate between mother and stranger within 24 hours after birth, and that is based on voice and smell. 
And the developing neural systems are obviously auditory and olfactory. Olfactory, by the way, I think is a very neglected system in these early, um, not well enough studied in these early um, days. And newborns can discriminate between their self and other baby's cries within 24 hours after birth. And for example, they will vocalize more when they hear another infant. The developing neural system for that is auditory, and there's a regulatory skill that that shows, which is they're already be beginning to be able to control their own vocalization. Um, another set of examples. This is slightly older. Infants can detect features at three to four months. Um, for example, they can determine the likelihood of event recurrence after two prior episodes. The developing neural systems include visual, auditory, and circadian. Uh, and the regulatory skills that that suggests that they're already developing are that they are developing rules for expectancy based on prior experience. Um, infants can form schema by five months. They can recognize, for example, a photo after a two-week hiatus. Uh, and the regulatory skill that that suggests is that they are developing models for human and, or, and other environmental inputs. They can form pre-symbolic categories by six months. Uh, for example, they have uh, sensory and, sensual and conceptual categories. Uh, they, developing neural systems involved are both sensory and motor. Um, and the regulatory skill that, that they then have by six months it involves rudimentary representational skills. So um, just to get back again to what it looks, what some of these things look like um, and how you, might, how you might look psychodynamically at how some of these skills are developing, uh, again, I'm going to argue that we have to look in the very tiny interactions, the second-by-second second interactions between um, caregivers and, and their offspring. And here, um, I've looked at a code, one of the codes we've taken from the videotapes we've been analyzing, which is standing with maternal assist. Um, and I'm going to play the boy and the girl simultaneously, um, and then I'm going to go back over a, uh, a little bit of what they've said, if I can get this mouse doing Sorry, there's a TV in the background there that was being taped or radio. Um, okay, so there's the good boy, aren't you getting strong? Um, I just, for a minute, I, I'd like to see what you see in comparing in comparing those two um, those two tapes. Just a few quick things. Uh, I think I'm not going to be able to write very effectively with this mouse on here, but we can just shout outs. What are some things you see comparing the boys and the girls in those two little clips? Okay, so there's an object. Um, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah. Let me take one more, and then I want to comment on this a little more. Any Any others? I think those are actually the main ones. Um, so, one of the things those both got coded as maternal assist standing. And now one of the things I want to do is go back and really recode the maternal assist standings to see if those differences hold up. Um, those, I just, I had a student make lo these little movie clips of each of the codes at different ages. 
And I just went through and grabbed a couple of the same age, and those are the two. So I, I'm not going to make a statistical claim for this at all. I don't have any data for that. Um, <clears throat> but it's the kind of thing we can then go look at. And, and I would urge, if there are any developmental psychologists in the audience uh, who want to start a study, that to, if we want to study the emergence of gender, it's this kind of very tiny, that was a, a few second interaction that we want to be looking at to look at how gender becomes part of uh, the body and part of preferences in little children. Um, that, to, that the older feminist way of looking at it, which was to talk about reinforcement or punishment or praise, um, is, is it's A, too late. I mean, by the time we're talking to a three-year-old about whether he should love a football or a doll, um, he's already got some pretty strong ideas of what he loves. And I don't think it comes so much from that, from that uh, present, object presentation at that age. I think that the co self-concept of gender starts much earlier, and it starts from these very physical things that are going on that include excitement, affection, the way in which a child is held, the way in which they're interacted with. Um, and these are the things that one can see emerging from, um, from these kinds of, of um, of second-by-second second studies. So uh, this is now, again, kind of a review of what I've already been over. This is, uh, this is 0 to 18 months, and I'm talking about pre-symbolic gender formation. And I have here infant brain development. Uh, I've got double arrows everywhere, and I've thrown in a few more arrows just to show you that there's, I think there's a lot of, of things going on here. But infant brain development both affects and is affected by external input into the world. Um, infant brain development affects uh, physiological rec regulation. Uh, and uh, we have here ongoing regulation, disruption, and repair of, of uh, caregiver infant interaction. So caregivers and infants will lock into a, an interaction, and then that will get disrupted, and then they may remake it, that's what the repair is, um, and heightened affective moments, like that moment that the mother was, um, was playing with the big stuffed animal with the child. I'm honestly not sure whether it was a boy or a girl. Um, but uh, the, uh, and so related to that is what's called dyad synchrony, and that's established through eye contact, parental touch, affect, and vocalization. Um, and then later on, you have all of the clothes, toys, faces, voices, and gendered adults that are in the infant's world from, um, from the very start. So this is pre-symbolic gender formation. These are the things that are happening in the first year. Uh, and then you have, from 18 to 24 months, the emergence of symbolic gender formation. And here, you begin, children begin to be able, you begin to be able to to have children who can verbally label themselves and other as either boy or girl, or even non-verbally. They can, if even in the pre-verbal, um, but say a two-year-old who isn't yet verbal, you can show them a picture and say which picture is more like you, and you can show them a picture of a boy and a girl, and they can, um, and, and that comes online slowly. So at first, they require the trappings of gender. So at first, if you show them a naked child, they can't tell which one is more like them. Um, but if you show them one with long hair and a dress, um, then they can tell whether, whether it's more like them or not. So to begin with, they really require the trappings of what we would call gender in order to, to self-identify. Only later do they, uh, do, they, do they become able to refer to anatomy to tell whether they're a boy or a girl. Um, so they, but they also begin to have a peer play, pre, play preferences and play styles as sex differences. They have toy preferences. They have, um, I'll get back in a sec to these notions of gender stability. Um, they have the symbolic object concepts of masculine and feminine. So you can begin to show them pictures of, uh, at an 18 months, uh, show them a, uh, an 18 month old, a picture of a woman with a hammer in her belt or a man putting on lipstick. And they're, they're looking at picture, 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 and then that picture comes up between them and go, huh? So they already have learned that there's something unusual about that, and, uh, but that's, a, um, that's uh, be, is, uh, the beginning of symbolic formation, that and knowledge of feminine stereotyped activities. 
So the critical li link in here, of course, is language, um, because it's in this period from pre-symbolic gender representation to this older period that language is really beginning to emerge, and language development is what I would argue, I, have, I can't prove it to you, but in, in the theory I'm, I'm set, setting up, it's language that begins to allow the transition from this pre-symbolic, essentially deeply neural recognition of gender to the symbolic formations of gender, which become then part of gender identity. So moving towards the end of the, of the talk, um, the, and there, we'll have a little time for questions, and I hope then, is again the claim I started out with, which is that gender identity develops. Uh, that's my starting point always. Um, and first, children begin learning about gender-related characteristics, and this phase starts in infancy and continues during the toddler and preschool years. Second, they cannot identify themselves as boys or girls, say, at two years of age, by two and a half years of age, they have partial success, and by three years of age, um, they're pretty accurate identifying themselves as boys and girls. And I think not inconsequentially, three years of age is about the earliest time uh, we have reports of chi childhood gender identity issues. So a, um, a girl like Jazz, who I showed you the, the little clip of at age seven, um, began to be, uh, her parents began to recognize that she was rejecting a male gender identity at about three years of age. And when kids are brought into to psych clinics, it's never younger than that. Um, three years is the earliest, often it's four or five or six years uh, of age when they're brought into clinics for, um, for evaluation from psychologists or psychiatrists. So I would argue that that when gender identity variation appears, that is variants who are at variance with what their anatomy says, the earliest they appear is at the moment or at the period when the process of gender, uh, symbolic representations of gender and self are becoming internalized. So, and then third, they don't yet have, um, have a uh, concept of gender constancy, and that develops a bit later um, between four and seven years. And the, and the notion of gender constancy is just that once you're a girl, you're always a girl. Um, and I tell this story pretty much at every talk I give, um, but in general, younger kids don't have even often a sense of species constancy. Um, so when I asked my, when she was two and a half years old, my great niece, what she wanted her to be when she grew up, she said, a pony. Um, <laughs> and, and that's actually not an unusual response for a child that age to give. They, they don't, they haven't figured out yet that, that their anatomy um, uh, usually determines w whether they're going to be a boy or a girl and that they're going to be a human for their whole life and not some other creature. Um, that, that sense, that knowledge comes later and gradually also, but usually by seven years of, old, of age, most kids understand um, that in that narrow sense, anatomy is destiny. Um, so the frameworks then that I want us to think about. First, the embodied gender, by which I mean a sense of self as male or female, and also degrees of masculinity and femininity. So we can have a sense of ourself as male, but also a sense of ourself as being very feminine in a variety of ways that we then mark with cultural markers that are specific to our culture um, or other ways around, that these take shape during the first three years of life, that sex, gender, and sexuality are embodied phenomena. They are dynamic processes, and those continue throughout life, while I'm focused on these early years. Uh, and that to understand the origin of variations in sex, gender, and sexuality, we have to study their emergence and changes over time. And then lastly, with specifics, Infants develop and learn by sensory input. Um, their brain connectivity pl proliferates, and that this starts even before birth. Some outside information gets in even before birth, especially um, auditory. 
infants are exposed to gender differentiation from before birth, um, especially now when so many parents know ahead of time whether they are carrying a boy or a girl, that, that especially the way in which they talk to their, to their fetus that they're carrying, it can be gender differentiated even before birth. And then, of course, they're born into a bedroom that's already been fixed up for um, the, expected, uh, the expected sex. Uh, infants bring their own individually differentiated nervous systems to the table, and we don't understand very much about how that helps to set up the interaction. That's a whole area that requires a lot more work. Um, and infants develop gender recognition skills during the first year, and these are coded pre-symbolically in the sensory and motor systems. Infants develop gender performance skills and preferences during the second year. And with language, these consolidate during years two and three into internal identity attached to embodied and external gendered symbols. So both the sense of self and then um, the external symbols, which are toys, activity levels, peer preferences, uh, various kinds of behaviors that we associate with ma masculinity and femininity or boyness and girlness. Um, so that's really the big picture, the story that I want to give to you, and I'd like to stop at this point and um, ask for questions or comments. Question. Yes. Um, it's a rather obvious on the nose political question by the presentation. I'm going to ask it anyway. So if you're right, and if the uh, attractors you've discussed in early infancy have some bearing on uh, sex difference, is it then incumbent upon us uh, to child rear in such a way that a child's gender identity is likely to be consistent with its apparent biological mm -hmm. sex, as has been the convention? I know we're a lot more sensitive nowadays to difficulties that can arise uh, when those things um, aren't consistent. But if, <coughs> if the things you're discussing become sort of conscious and deliberate, rather than simply being a matter of uh, uh, tacit norms, do we risk creating unnecessary difficulties for the child uh, if we fail to adhere to those norms in child rearing? Okay, so um, that's a great question, and you're right, it, it is a question, it's a question I've heard before, and it's, it's, it's I think, a totally legitimate question to ask. Um, and in order to answer that, answer that, I'd like to have you think back to that, um, that 3D graph. Uh, because if you begin to think about um, the many different factors that are coming into, oh, thank you for bringing that back to me. Uh, where are we? It's back up here, isn't it? Where are you? Here we go. Um, this. So the question is here, first of all, you have infants starting at different places here, at place A here or place B here or place C here. Um, we don't understand, first of all, where these different starting places are. I don't even know that these are the, the most important measures. Um, they're just ones that are usually taken in mass, um, in mass population studies. So I have them, so I played with them. Um, so, uh, so if you start with measures like these, we don't even know how being born in this area of the graph begins to be the infant's part of setting up a parent-infant interaction. We do know that there are many different parenting styles and skills, um, so, and, and we don't necessarily think that there's only one correct parenting style. Uh, and we are a very long way from understanding how any of these styles and skills pro literally in a, you know, in a one, two, three, four sequence produce gender identity. So, um, and I don't know that we, if we're talking about a process with maybe a hundred different components to it, it's not clear to me that there ever, we would ever be able to come up with a prescriptive account of how to raise a certain kind of gender. Um, and, uh, and so, and I think certainly we, we need to keep, although I've emphasized the parent-infant inf interaction here, we really do need to keep in mind the individual differences that infants bring to the story. So, um, so 
I think that um, that thinking that we can come up with a, a prescriptive approach to child rearing that would raise us that perfect girl or that perfect boy and and or a very only masculine boys and none of these feminine little boys or vice versa or God forbid someone like uh, uh, that's in quotes I'm being sarcastic um, some just just in case uh, uh, don't take me literally the a child like Chaz whose um, gender identity is at odds with her anatomy um, I, I I don't see that we can ever get to a point where we could accurately change that. Um, so, because there's there's too many variables floating out floating out there, and and how and ha if one is high and one is low for one kid, that might might then predict a certain next step. But in another kid, the other thing might be high and the other low, and that might predict a different step. So, uh, I I just can't see that that's. I, I understand that that's a fear. I can't see that it's um, a real fear if you really got down to could we do that. So, Other questions or comments? Yeah, um, I heard a yes, but yes. I was, I was wondering about the effect of growing up with a single parent, usually female, or um, a mother and father. And I remember a study years ago, I don't know if it's held up, which suggested that men were more likely to stick with their mates if they had sons. And if that's true, then boys are more likely to grow up with a father in the household or than girls, or at least girls with boys are more likely, whatever. And I'm wondering if that cashes out in any way. Um, I don't know the study. I, I actually have to say I, I can't answer you. I don't really know the answer or whether there is an answer for that. Um, I think the other the other tricky thing in these studies, including the the data set that I have, it's a what you know what I call a found data set. I didn't find it in the street, but a colleague did these studies, did these videotapes for a totally other purpose, and the kids that you just saw there are now 23 years old or something, so. I'm already looking a generation past at child rearing practices. Um, it's also a very restricted sample. It's, um, it's uh, only stay at home moms from middle class Rhode Island families. So um, it's, not, it's not like a diverse study. But, um, but so all I think you can get from the study I did is um, an approach to how you might want to design studies today if you're interested in gender development. Uh, but I also think that um, that the question of parenting um, and gender is really a moving target. So, because parenting styles are changing, gender in parenting is changing. Um, uh, male parents today uh, play, is Mad Men popular over here, the show? The, yeah, okay. So, um, so the fathers in Mad Men are very different from many middle class fathers today in terms of how they play with their parent with their kids how they interact um, including stay at home dads so i think one has to um, always remember that your that a study done 20 years ago is is on parenting styles has to be redone probably um, to get to get a new idea of what's going on i don't know if that helps or not but Margaret. I, I just wondered about. Oh no. Okay. It's all, right. it's all right. I'll talk to you after. Yes. Who's speaking? I can't oh, see. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Hi. I was just wondering about precisely those things you referred to at the end about the changes in practices about parenting, the differences which might be cultural differences, might be differences of class and other issues, and how you allow for that. And also, I wondered. Given the first question, couldn't we also take it from the other point of view about how we can bring up children without expectations about gender stereotypical reinforcement? Um, okay, so with regard to how do you allow for cultural differences, you have to study it. I mean, that's it is, and really, um, it's it's an empirical question from my point of view of of. Uh, 
which is if you want to take the theoretical framework I've provided, you have to then look at it empirically in different cultures, um, in different subcultures, uh, in, uh, you can, you can, you could probably even do it historically using historical images or things like that, but, but to begin with, you have to ask, I think you'll get a sense of the richness of gender formation and gender identity formation only when you begin to look at all of the, at different um, cultures, different times, uh, different places. Uh, so, uh, so what I'm suggesting is a framework but that you could use to begin to look at gender. You, so you have to find out how gender is culturally defined in different cultures or subcultures, um, and then what the different parenting styles are, and also with regard to class. It's from my point of view, um, you can use the framework to get at that question, but then you have to design a study that's designed to answer that question. Um, most developmental psychology studies are done, um, you know, with a population that's near a university, and uh, that's that already fixes sort of a situation for you. Um, so you have to move a little bit further out into the world. Uh, and I would give the same answer to you. Could we could we raise gender gender open kids? Uh, I'm sure we can raise kids who are more gender open. Uh, and in fact, I think kids are being raised in a more gender open way today than they were 30 years ago, um, partly at least in the States. Again, for legal reasons, you have things like, um, like the opening up of school athletics to girls that in my day didn't exist. Um, so that you now have included in the, in the definition of femininity or, or femaleness for girls is sports. Um, which wasn't included in, in the, de the era of Mad Men when I was in grade school and high school. Um, so uh, so if, you, if you take a long view, you begin to see these things are changing, but you also have a tremendous force of culture coming into the, the parent-child interaction, um, and you have individual differences again. You have at, at a certain age, peers, these kinds of things. So just as I don't think it would be all that easy to engineer um, only uh, proper gender identities, nor do I think it would be that easy to engineer on purpose proper um, gender neutrality. Uh, so I, because I think there, there are too many variables coming into the picture on the, and on the one hand. And on the other hand, I do think we see that um, that gender um, roles are changing enormously and the things little girls think they can do and little boys think they can do have changed enormously in 30 years. So, uh, so, but that's going along with a much bigger cultural and political change. So it's not just about child rearing in the home to change these things. Good, thank you.